Good morning. How many of you sung along with all the hymns that they played? You just can't keep yourself from doing that. I stumbled on a couple of words here and there, but that was beautiful. Thank you so very, very much. And welcome. Everyone is welcome here. We welcome all of you who have joined us live and those of you who are joining us by way of our videos. It's good to be in God's house. Uh, just a reminder before we begin, uh, at noon today, or possibly a little bit before that, we will convene our called church conference. And the conference report booklets are back on the table where the bulletins and the offering plate and so forth are. Uh, not totally necessary that you have one during the conference, uh, but if you would like to slip back there and pick one up uh, to follow along, you certainly may. The other thing back there are our self-contained communion cups. And so they are located in the balcony and, and uh, on the, the outside this uh, exit for those going up that side of the balcony and then here uh, at the same table over there. If you forgot yours, maybe during a hymn or something, you can slip back there and pick one up. And by the way, uh, I know that some of you are not official members of our church. Unofficially, you're certainly very much a part of our family. And if, if you uh, do not wish to attend the conference uh, at the conclusion of our closing hymn, which is the Lord's Prayer, uh, you may excuse yourself, uh, but you're certainly welcome to stay as well. We're blessed today with the flowers on the altar given in loving memory of Clyde Burford on his 86th birthday, April 27th, given by Sarah Burford. And thank you for those flowers. As you are able, I invite you to stand as we sing, I Sing Praises. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. We bless you, loving God, and we praise your name forever and ever. And who claims us each one as brothers and sisters with our Lord Jesus Christ.
Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Our Board of Deacons <clears throat> every year uh, comes up with a, a plan for our missions emphases uh, during that year, and this month, the month of May, will be the Crisis Pregnancy Center of Tidewater. I think very appropriate for the month of May, of course, because of Mother's Day. I went on their website to just refresh my memory, and I want to read a statement they had there. This is very impressive. The Crisis Pre Pregnancy Center of Tidewater is a Christ-centered organization. Great way to start their statement off. Reaching out to women and families facing unplanned pregnancies. They currently operate three medical clinics and two pregnancy centers. Their medical clinics uh, offer ultrasound services, prenatal vitamins, and medical consults. All locations offer pregnancy testing, options counseling, community referrals, practical help, and here, listen to this one, parenting classes with Bible study, and all services are free and confidential. There's a logo that's on, very prominent on their website, and it so happens I know a little bit about this organization. It's the Evangelical Council on Financial, oh gosh, Accountability. It is an organization that was founded back, I think, in the 1970s, primarily for churches and for other uh, nonprofit religious organizations to provide a list of guideline, financial guidelines that provide for security and honesty and transparency and all of that. And although our church is not a member of this organization, I think we comply absolutely in, in every respect with that as well. So to me, um, in my mother's generation, you'd call it the good housekeeping seal of approval. And so I'm very pleased that they are a member of that, and I hope that you will uh, pray for them. They did, uh, I got a flyer the other day. Uh, they're asking that as we celebrate motherhood, pray for the expectant mothers who visit our clinics, that God will embolden their hearts to protect the life he has created inside them. So please put them on your prayer list as well. Would you join me in our offertory prayer? Oh God of love, I'm sorry, <laughs> wrong prayer. Have, uh, would, you, would you rewind the tape just a little bit there? <laughs> 
Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are the owner and we are the managers of all you entrust to us. Help us to live for you each day and to generously share the time, talents, and treasures you have given us. Amen. It's time for the Lamb's Club. We don't turn down offerings, especially to the Lambs Club project. We haven't talked about that for a while, but that's a project to buy some animals for the farmers uh, in Haiti. They might, we might be able to buy a chicken or maybe uh, a lamb or something like that for them. Can you girls scoot down so these two little lambs can sit too? Okay. Welcome. All right. So Lucy Lamb, in her designer mask, of course, says what? What does she say? It starts with a B. I didn't hear that, and it's probably better maybe <laughs> that. <laughs> be kind every single day. Well, good. You're on a roll there, young man. All right. He's a brave young man. He's up here with uh, all females, so hang in there, buddy. <laughs> okay. I would like... For each one, oh, and by the way, Lucy Lamb is the founder and president of the Lamb's Club, but Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want all of you to look down at your feet and tell me if you have anything on your feet. Someone said shoes, that you're right. Do you wear shoes all the time? Do you sometimes go barefoot? Well, sometimes you do. When I was a little boy, I hated to go barefoot. My f I, I was a tenderfoot before I, even before I joined the Boy Scouts. And I just couldn't stand gravel and, and rocks and stuff like that. So I wore tennis shoes all the time. But sometimes we like to take our shoes off. Now, Mrs. Halley went to the store the other day, and she couldn't resist buying these beautiful, what do you call these, flip-flops. Flip okay. They're, they, they feel real nice. So, back in the days of Jesus, of course, they had shoes, and they were mostly sandals, kind of like I saw sandal here. Here's some sandals, looks like. And walking through the dusty roads, feet would get very dusty. So just about every house when you came in had a bowl of water there that you would wash your feet because they were dusty and probably leave your shoes at the door. In fact, I know a family here in Suffolk, it's their habit that when they first come in, they wear socks. They just take their shoes off and wear socks in the house. So, even when Jesus at the Last Supper, he went around and washed all the disciples' feet because they were dirty. And if you remember the story of Moses when he saw the burning bush and he, he went closer to find out what it was, he heard the voice of God that said, Moses, take off what? Your shoes. That's right. Why? Because the ground... 
Yeah, but he wasn't inside the house at that time. I think I, think I, I see a budding young minister here. <laughs> And one day he's going to lead the Lambs Club, and I'm going to be his cheering section. Thank you for, for your uh, comments that you make, because that, that tells me you're really listening. So shoes are very, very important. And one of the things we wear are the shoes of peace, because when our shoes lead us into groups and other places, we're there to bring happiness and to bring peace. So God bless you. Let's sing the Lamb's Club song. Anybody remember Art Linkletter? <laughs> Kids say the darndest things. I remember watching that, and, and I don't know if it was live or not, but one time a little boy said something that if it wasn't live, they would have cut it out. <laughs> As we come to our time of prayer, Please take your prayer guide home with you and put it somewhere uh, that you will notice it and look over it. Uh, for us, that's on the door of the, of the refrigerator. I wanted to give an update. You, I've had several questions about our church secretary, Amy Peterson, and she had um, a place on her back that had to be worked on, and she is hopefully going to be cut loose on Tuesday. Uh, so she appreciates your interest and your prayers. Last Sunday, uh, those of you who were here might have noticed that Glenn Ellis's brother, Alan, came with him. And he had a, a, like, a like a baby carrier sack thing, I guess you'd call it. And the baby inside was a beautiful miniature Yorkie, I think it was. And I told the early service, in my opinion, uh, that little dog was probably the best behaved uh, creature, if you will, <laughs> of all of us last Sunday during the service. But the news that Alan had was not good news. Uh, Glenn has been diagnosed with throat cancer. He had a surgical procedure yesterday at Norfolk General, and there was a question whether we'd go home that evening or today. So please lift Glenn and his family in your prayers. Let us pray. O oh God of light, we have heard your message proclaimed of old that in you there is no shadow of turning, there is no dark cloud at all. There's nothing in all of creation that can hide the light of your presence. And forgive us, Lord, when we cling to the shadows, 
when we fail to heed your call to wake up and join in the work of your kingdom. Send us, O God, that we might do your deeds of mercy and peace to feed the hungry, to shelter the homeless, to touch the sick with your healing, to console those who are in sorrow, to visit prisoners, and to welcome the stranger. In times of deep shadows, O God, guide us, we pray. Keep us from despair when we see that there's a lack of peace and security. And lift our eyes always toward you that we may see your face shining down upon us, that we may walk in your light. Comfort with your presence those who are living in the shadow of grief, those who are mourning the loss of children, parents, spouses, friends, and colleagues. Give comfort to all of us who are missing loved ones and reassure us that both the living and the dead are in your care. And may we be confident of being joined again in the unbroken circle as we will sing your praise forever. We offer this prayer, O Lord, only because you have called us to come into your family. And you have invited us to bring our heart's desires to you. And so in the name of Jesus and under the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit, we pray this. Amen.
Thank you, Muriel. We are so blessed with musical talent. Could you clap for that? God's blessing of great talent. <laughs> Actually, uh, I met my wife in the music department at, our, at Marshall University. As a matter of fact, you're not going to believe this, but I was taking voice lessons, <laughs> obviously failing the course, and she was assigned at random, well, it wasn't random to God, but anyway, to, to play for me. Well, took one look at her, and I was done singing. <laughs> Oh, where were we? <laughs> the passage that we're reading today from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 <clears throat> was actually written before the Gospels were written. And so the passage we have here today is the very earliest account of the Lord's Supper. It doesn't differ all that much to the other ones that came on later, but that's a little interesting point to keep in mind. And here's what Paul said to that church. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let me pause a moment. Jesus never said anything about his body being broken. The bread was broken, but not his body. And when I learned that and learned that distinction, I had to kind of fight a long tradition that, that was just on that tape in my head that we talk about the broken body of Christ. So that's a little distinction that Paul makes. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen, fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hung hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. Another little footnote. Do any of you know of some churches, and primarily, in my experience at least, they've been sort of the what we used to call the country churches way up up a holler or on a ridge somewhere who did not believe in fellowship dinners in the church building 
Anybody in, in my, I've known churches like that. They were adamant that you don't eat in the church. And, and they actually take this text, they take, it, uh, they take the text out of context, in my opinion, but that's what they base that belief on. And I think it's a pity because some of the greatest good times of fellowship happen around the table, and I have missed it terribly. So please pray. There's many reasons to pray that this goes away, and that's a good one right there. Judas had already left the meal to go make arrangements to betray Jesus leaving Jesus with the other 11 disciples. The Passover meal was instituted way, way back in the history of the Israelites when they were slaves in Egypt, if you recall. God had instructed them to eat this meal on the evening before they were to escape from, uh, uh, from uh, Egypt the next day. And ever since then, every year, even up until today, devout Jews gather with family and friends to remember the bondage of their ancestors and to celebrate God's delivery, uh, which in a, in a, a theological sense is sort of like what Jesus did, redeeming them out of slavery into freedom. Now, as far as the disciples knew that uh, that evening's supper would be just like the many that they had had throughout their life, but they weren't counting on Jesus and the surprises that he had in store for them. He was just about to shock them as he changed the Passover tradition right before their very eyes. One commentator suggested that if Jewish leaders had been in that room that night, and I'll quote from what he wrote, they would have torn their clothes in half and started screaming at the top of their lungs that he, Jesus, was a heretic. There were two things God commanded the people to do at Passover, and one of those was to celebrate that meal every year. And by the way, the Jewish calendar and the calendar that uh, I think they call it the Gregorian calendar or something, they don't match up exactly, but Passover is generally sometime around the time that we celebrate Easter uh, in the spring of the year. And Carmen and I were very blessed in Virginia Beach to have neighbors directly across the street who were Jewish and who graciously invited us to come uh, to uh, celebrate the Passover with them. It, it was a, well, wonderful meal, but just a wonderful tradition. Uh, he always teased me when I uh, retired from the Navy and went to work in, in the sales industry. He said, you were only working one day a week and you retired and now you're working five days a week. I don't understand that. <laughs> Rest in peace, Stanley, my friend. The meal itself was highly ritualistic, even today. The head of the household, of course, was the host and they walked the family or the guests that were there through each of the various elements of the meal each step reminding them of something about the exodus and the deliverance of their ancestors from slavery. Now since, of course, the disciples were Jewish, they would have known the meaning of all the elements of the meal. Uh, in fact, probably any one of them could have come up and led the meal themselves. It was that familiar. And yet on that night, Jesus, the head of this particular household of faith, stood up and for the first time in the history of the Jewish people, he broke tradition and did Passover differently from what it had ever been done before. The meal had four cups of wine on the table, um, uh, representing the four promises God made in the sixth chapter of Exodus. 
the host, Jesus, would hold up the first cup and remind the family that God was going to rescue them from Egypt. Then he would pass the cup around to everyone. Each one would take a drink and remember this promise from God. You will be liberated. Then he would pick up the second cup and remind them of the second promise, that God would free them from slavery. And then it was passed around to everyone. Before the host would pick up the third cup, he would pick up some bread. It was uh, communion bread, as we would call it, or or, uh, uh, bread that had no yeast in it. He would hold it up and break it, reminding them that this bread stood for affliction. It was unleavened uh, in Jesus' day, just like in in their day. Uh, I would call unleavened bread more like a cracker. In fact, I have a sample I'm going to refer to when we come to our communion. I kind of like it. It's tasteless, real thin. And obviously, you got to put something on top. Peanut butter is a good choice to put on it. Other things as well. But that was the kind of bread that they had. Each one would take a piece and remember the affliction that their ancestors suffered in Egypt. But this night, Jesus broke that tradition when he said, Eat this bread. It is my body. They'd never heard that before. They were shocked with this break in tradition. And from then on to today, in our service today, this broken bread no longer represents only the affliction of their ancestors, but it represents the body of Jesus who took every single bit of that affliction Onto himself. So when the bread was eaten, Jesus picked up the third cup, reminding them that God was going to redeem his people by his own power. If you lived in the 50s and I guess early 60s maybe, you know what redemption is all about because you had green stamps. And you licked every one of them and put them in that booklet. And a booklet that started off that thick after you added the, the, uh, the little stamps became about that thick. You went to a redemption center. And you traded the stamps for something of value, a, a pot or a pan or something of that nature. S&H green stamps. Remember what S&H stood for? Sperry and Hutchinson. I don't know my name, but I can remember silly details (laughs) from years ago like that. God is saying that he will pay the price to redeem us from a life of sin and destruction. But when Jesus held up the third cup, he said, this is the blood of of the new covenant, my blood shed for you, poured out for many. This is the blood that will redeem God's people. Another shocking statement that they had never heard before. Of course, the main course of the Passover meal was a lamb. Uh, And you may recall that at that first Passover, when they slaughtered the lamb, they took a, a branch to make sort of a a homemade paintbrush, if you will, and took some of the blood, God had told them to do this, and put it on the doorpost, probably outside, so that when the death angel passed over the nation of Egypt, uh, the angel would pass over those faithful households that were so marked. Although Jesus didn't talk about that lamb that evening, it was clear from that point on you didn't have to have that lamb anymore because Jesus was the lamb. And his sacrifice would not have to be repeated year after year after year. It was once and for all. 
to redeem, to buy back his people. Now we come to the fourth cup of wine and the fourth promise was that one day God would completely restore and renew the relationship he has with his people. Again, Jesus broke with tradition. He did not pass that one around because he said, Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So there's coming a day when all the people of God redeemed through the blood of the Lamb not just this generation, but future generations and past generations. We're going to be around the great table in heaven that the Bible calls the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's when we will take the fourth cup and joyously have it together. Our communion hymn is, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Please remain seated as we sing. Here is the unleavened bread I spoke about. Comes in, whoops, someone's already had a, a bit of it. Um, I'll leave this up here, and if anyone wants to uh, check it out, have a little taste, you certainly may. Uh, but th this is what is typically used even today during the Passover meal. Lots of traditions about this bread. And this bread is, is baked in Jerusalem and then imported here. We celebrate communion not alone, but rather in concert with our sisters and brothers literally all over the world in languages that we probably have never even heard of. The traditions and the liturgy, I'm sure, varies a bit with, from uh, time to time and place to place. But let's be aware that we are part of a worldwide family of God. Please pray with me. Almighty God, send the power of your Holy Spirit upon us that we may remember anew the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. May your Spirit help us to know in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this cup the presence of Christ 
who gave his body and his blood for all. Being washed and made clean through his precious blood, may your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in service to all the world. Amen. We remember that night when Jesus was with his disciples, and he took that loaf of bread, the the, uh, unleavened bread, and he broke the bread, passed it to them, and said, Take and eat of this. This is my body given for you. In like manner, he took the cup, that that cup we were talking about, and said, this cup is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many, many others for the remission of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you please take your bread? Almighty God, we thank you for this bread and for all that you provide to sustain us. Above all, merciful Father, we thank you for Christ given for the life of the world, the body of Christ, bread from heaven. Almighty God, we thank you for this fruit of the vine and for every good gift that gives us joy. We thank you above all for Christ our Lord by whose blood you have bought us and bound us to be your people in an everlasting covenant, the blood of Christ shed for you. Lord Jesus, it is a great privilege to come before your throne of grace and partake of these precious sacraments of bread and wine. Thank you for dying for us on the cross and paying the enormous price for our sins that we may be forgiven and receive life eternal. Amen. Thank you.
with approving the minutes that have been shared with you. You will find those in the conference report just after the agenda, so it's the second page. I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes that have been shared with you. Thank you, Mr. Queen. Can I get a second? Thank you, Carmen Govan. The motion has been made and seconded to accept the minutes. Are there any discussion in regards to the minutes from our last conference? With no discussion, we will call the vote to accept the minutes from the October 25th, 2020 meeting. All in favor of accepting the meeting as reported for the Fall Church Conference on October 25th, 2020, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries. New order of business. At this time, I'm going to call Amy Hott up to the podium, who is the chair of the Board of Finance, as well as Judy Yor, our church secretary, to present, excuse me, I'm sorry, treasurer. I made your secretary, didn't I? No, we need, we need you to be the treasurer, <laughs> church, treasurer for sure, um, up as well to present um, the treasurer's report and the proposed budget. Thank you, Dana. Um, as far as any additional information, um, I do believe we have all can agree on that COVID hasn't been very friendly to all of us. Uh, it has changed the way that we live. Um, the mask is you know, one thing, but what it has also made me personally aware of we knew Suffolk Christian was our church, our family church, but COVID really opened my eyes to see how wonderful our staff really are, how dedicated they are, how creative they have become in reaching out to us and to our community through COVID and, and all of the CDC guidelines. That they never gave up. And that is the passion that keeps this church open. The passion from our members and their dedication, that keeps our church open. And we are so grateful for each and every one of you. <laughs> Last but not least, God is good. Yes, ma'am. I invite Judy. All right, I don't need to tell you it's been a challenging year, a little over a year now that we have struggled through <coughs> COVID. Um, we wanted to provide you with just an overview of our finances for 2020. Um, <coughs> I won't go into a, a huge amount of detail. You have the summary report in your book. Um, I will say that through a lot of, of challenges, our needs were met and we, we finished the year in a positive spot. Um, I had very strong doubts that we would be able to do that back in March when things were sh shutting down and we couldn't have services and I'm starting to run through my head, where can we get money from to pay the bills? You know. Um, we made a commitment early on to continue to pay our staff. We managed to do that and have continued to manage to do that. Um, but it has been a challenge. Um, our budget going into 2020, pre-COVID, was a little over $333,000. That's what we were expecting to need to get through the year. Um, our income actual revenue ended up being $279,350. So as you can see, there's quite a discrepancy there, about $55,000 short, if you just look at those numbers. Um, I want, if you look at the revenue page, the first uh, page of your financial report for 2020 shows our revenue. I just want to clarify those, those numbers there. Um, 
If you look all the way down at the bottom line, it looks like our revenue for the year was $522,000, roughly. That's not right. Um, what that is showing you is, first of all, we had mission donations of 13583 That mission money is your, your yellow monthly envelopes you put in the offering plate. This is where we keep tally of how much you've given. And then at the end of, or throughout the year, but certainly by the end of the year, all that gets paid out. So it's listed as revenue because it's money coming in, but it turns around and goes right back out wherever it was designated to go. So it's not really income. And then the other income item that is listed there under transfer account income of a little over $229,000, that <clears throat> was also an in and out transaction. We were moving some of our investment money from one place to another. So we had to deposit it into this account, write a check to put it back out somewhere else. N not really income. So when you factor all that out, our actual revenue was $279,350. Our actual expenses, when you also factor out the missions, was $278,364, which means that we ended up, to the good, $985 for the year, and that's with using no investment income to cover anything. That was straight up donations got us where we needed to be. So God is good. We got exactly what we needed, exactly when we needed it. That continues to this day. Um, we, there have been a lot of adjustments made, but we have gotten exactly what we needed, exactly when we needed it. It is amazing when I look back on the year and when I look at where we are so far in 2021 that that continues to happen. And I have no other explanation other than God is good and he's looking out for us. Um, now, how we, how we paid all the bills and they only total $278,000, we have to give a tremendous thanks to our staff. We had a number of staff people take voluntary pay cuts came to us, we, we voted as a board, we discussed it, we decided we would not impose any kind of involuntary pay cut on anyone. We talked about it, we decided we didn't want to go there. But we had staff come forward and say, please don't keep paying me this much money, please just give me this, or please don't pay me at all while I'm not working. All of that came together as a big help to help us bring the budget down to where it was achievable for us. Um, and then other things, obviously with the church being closed, the bills were a little less. We might not have used as much electricity. You know, um, choir hasn't been meeting, so we haven't been having to buy sheet music and that kind of stuff. I mean, just each category came in less than what was originally budgeted. So that's where we ended up where we are. And it's been a blessing that we were able to get through it all, kept services going, kept the building open, paid all the bills, and did not have to dip into any reserves. I did not think we could do that, but we did. Um, then <clears throat> the, we're proposing, we did not vote on a budget Normally, our October conference, we would present a budget for the upcoming year. With the number of uncertainties we had, we decided not to do that this year. We didn't get pledges. We didn't do a budget. We were just kind of muddling along. Let's see how it goes. So we decided to kind of just carry forward with the budget we had and just keep, regardless of what the budget says, you got to pay the bills when they come in, and the offering is what it is. So, you know, we're trying to balance those two things. Um, but around February, the request was made that we come up with a budget that we could present in the spring, which is why we're here today, for the new year. Um, and I've done a whole lot of budgets in my day, but this was the most challenging one. Terry and I worked long and hard. We had a budget committee, but um, we met a number of times to hammer things out, figure out where we could, how, there were just so many unknowns 
We didn't know when things could open back up. When can we start having music again? When, you know, how much offering can we expect every month? We had no idea. So we had to make a lot of assumptions based on the information that we had, but it was hard. It was hard. Um, we decided to start with a base number of what our income was for 2020. Like, let's use that number. Let's assume we're not going to get any worse off than we were in 2020. And we started putting together a budget based on that. We, we did make some cuts that we intend to be temporary. For instance, you know, Christian Ed, we're not, Priscilla can't do all those activities right now, so they're not spending as much of their money as they would have. Um, again, the music, you know, I had talked to Janet, we're not buying sheet music, we're not doing, you know, there's a lot of, of things that we hope to be able to reinstate going forward, but we were trying to predict what do we need just to get through the rest of this year. And that's where those numbers came from. And then once again, God bless them, our staff stepped up and said, that cut I, I took last year, could we make that permanent? Could we make that permanent going forward? Or can you reduce my salary some more? We had all of those things happen just when we needed them to happen. No prompting from us. Our office staff decided they wanted their hours reduced so that the, the deacons approved the office not being open five days a week. And there were pay adjustments made there because of that, that were agreed to by all. Um, so there are cuts in here, but any salary cuts were at the request of the employee and are totally voluntary. But putting all that together, the budget pretty much balanced. We're looking right now at maybe having to pull about $3,000 out of investment income if that